Welcome to the Blackstone River Valley Volunteers and Park Skills Workshop Series with volunteer Mark Denon. With that, Mark, I thank you so much for volunteering to put this presentation together and take it away. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for setting up. Thank you for everybody for coming. So uh, today I wanted to talk about, about the geology of the Blackstone Valley, but I really wanted to um, have you learn to tell a story. You know, all rocks have a story. Sometimes, like you look at this, it's a trilobite. It's 500 year, million years old. It's from Africa. I mean, its story is pretty obvious, but a lot of times in the valley, um, we don't see big crystals. We don't see big fossils. We don't see many fossils at all. Um, we kind of think, ah, there's not much there. So I hope to, to give you uh, an appreciation between um, an appreciation of that every rock that you come by has a story. Every rock that you see on a hike or a bike or a canoe has a story. So I'm going to talk about the geological history of the Blackstone Valley, and I call it a song of ice and fire. So there's me. Um, I'm a supervising environmental scientist with the Department of Environmental Management. I'm also an adjunct professor at CCRI, and I am a volunteer in Parks program. I do uh, CPR instruction for a lot of the volunteers, and I do a lot of uh, the bike patrol as well. And sometimes I lead uh, bike rides, informational bike rides. And we can't do that right now because of the pandemic. But I thought, uh, because a lot of us are home, especially tonight, that maybe this would be a good time for us to learn about things that, that we could see. Everybody's out, the bike stores are sold out, the hike stores are sold out because everybody's outside. So everybody's outside and we can't be together. So I thought I would try to give you some things that you may use, give you some skills that you may use when you're out there on your own why we can't be together. Um, by the way, some recommended reading that really helps you to understand the history of the area. There's two books that I think are awesome. This is the Roadside Geology of Rhode Island and Connecticut by James Skeen. And this is the geology, Roadside Geology of Massachusetts, also by James Skeen. He is a geologist, I believe, with uh, Boston College, Father James Skeen. And with that, I will, uh, I will begin our presentation. So like I say, even though it doesn't look like much, this is a big rock at Lincoln Woods. What's so special about it? It was born under intense heat. It crystallized while visible life was just evolving. It was buried in a, by a giant Himalayan sized mountain range. It was uncovered and then it was smashed off by a glacier from, from, where, it, uh, from where it was. It was carried miles and miles by the glacier, uh, dropped in Lincoln Woods and split open by freezing and thawing and lately climbed on by a lot of human beings. So it just looks like, unless you know what you're looking for, it, it doesn't look like much. But when you do know what you're looking for, there's a billion years of history in this rock. Um, so I'm going to talk a, a little bit about, it's hard to talk about, and this is the difference between geology and rock collecting is we're not just looking at a specimen and seeing what is it. We're looking at where it came from, what it tells us about the world. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, plate boundaries. And the reason for that, uh, you will, hopefully you'll see the reason for that. Uh, most of you know the continents are not stable, that they move around at about the speed that your fingernails grow. So a couple of centimeters a year and uh, the plates move in different ways um, whenever two plates meet. The first is sometimes two plates meet and they get pushed apart. So the plate, I'm gonna, the plate gets pushed in this direction and this direction and the lava comes up in between. We used to think that the lava coming up pushes the plates apart. Now we think the plates get torn apart and the lava comes up because it's filling in uh, more like an empty void. But in any case, this is a divergent plate boundary. And it allows, uh, there are a lot of volcanoes, not the explosive type, the pretty type. Um, 
There were a lot of volcanoes here and some, some mild earthquakes. Uh, this is something like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge of today that separates North America and Europe. And North America and Europe are moving apart at about a, a couple of centimeters a year. And the, the rift in that case is um, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Iceland is part of that. Okay, I'm trying to advance my slide. It won't advance. Hold on. Patience, patience, patience. Okay. I'm not very patient. Why won't my slide it up? Oh, here we go. Sorry. Figured it out. All right. Um, so sometimes instead of uh, the way Mid-Atlantic Ridge, like in the, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge formed right that we have right now, at one time, North America and Europe were connected and this upwelling started occurring. It ripped the continent apart and then it formed a rift valley where there was a sea and then eventually there was an ocean and the ocean keeps getting bigger and bigger as it's been getting for 200 million years. So that's a divergent plate boundary where two plates diverge. Next, um, we're going to talk about, pardon me, yeah, it takes me a little, I got to erase my little markers here. Okay. So the opposite of two plates pulling apart is two plates coming together and two plates in a geologic sense crashing together. This is a violent collision. Um, could be an ocean hitting a continent, a continent and an ocean hitting together. An two ocean plates hitting together or a continent and an ocean hitting together. But whatever it is, it's going to be a violent collision. This is an example of, of an ocean going under a continent. This is what's happening in much of the western part of North America as well as South America. You have the Pacific Ocean Plate, which is thin and, and dense, and it's getting pushed down underneath the North American continent. The North American continent rides up because this is like having um, having a, a low profile Lamborghini hitting one of those uh, uh, giant trucks, you know, with the giant wheels. It's going to ride up on top because it's taller and lighter. So the continent rides up over the ocean. The ocean uh, material gets pushed down and then sometimes often you have melting down here when it gets pushed down far enough into the mantle it starts to melt and some of the light components float their way up you have these big pools of magma sometimes they crystallize in the earth over a long period of time sometimes they make it all the way to the top and then they explode in in explosive eruptions like mount saint helens or mount pinatubo uh, that they will suddenly blow up. So this is a divergent plate boundary, a uh, convergent plate boundary. So it's again, it's a collision. And this is all gonna come into play later, I promise. Um, sometimes you have two ocean plates that collide and it's a similar process. The older ocean plate is colder and denser. And there's a reason for that, but I probably don't have time to explain it. But two ocean plates collide and one of them, the denser one, the older one, goes down and the newer one goes on top. You still have a mid-ocean, uh, an oceanic trench. In this case, when you melt the material and it, it, it bubbles up, it also erupts in volcanoes and it forms what's called, and this is an important concept, so remember this term, an island arc. It's a, a series of islands out in the ocean and often it can be hundreds or even thousands of miles long. An example of this would be Japan. The Japanese islands are a volcanic arc. The Philippine islands, Indonesian islands are these large volcanic arcs, severe earthquakes, powerful volcanoes, and they're out in the middle of the ocean. So that's an island arc. Remember that term. Okay. I got to remember to erase my doodles here. Okay. Uh, sometimes the most violent event happens when you 
at first you have a convergent plate where a continent is overriding an ocean. And then over here, you got a continent overriding an ocean, right? And that, we all heard, learned about that happening. Eventually, there's no more ocean because this continent's going this way and this continent's going this way. So the two continents collide. And there, neither one of them wants to go under because they're both light material. So two huge continents collide, what happens? It goes up. Like when two cars collide, the hoods bend up. When two continents collide, the continent bends up. And that's what makes huge mountain ranges. And the only place that two continents are currently colliding is the Himalayas. Um, and of course, those are the largest mountains on the earth. Remember that also, um, two continents collide is a pretty momentous event. And that's been going on for about past 10 million years. It's why the Himalayas are still getting bigger. Okay, so how does this relate to New England, right? Well, the thing about North America, and, and again, I have to give you a little context for where the valley came from. The thing about North America is New England wasn't really part of the original continent of North America when it formed. It was called Laurentia at the time, which isn't important. But what is important is the boundary of North America was about here at the New York border. And all of New England was added on later. Um, where did New England come from? Remember those island arcs I talked about? Those uh, volcanoes out in the ocean? Well, they tend to get slapped on as these, as North America ate up and overrode some of those ancient oceans, those island arcs that were really like microcontinents. They were a little too big to just be obliterated. They tend to slap on to North America and they tended to move in this direction from the Southeast. So if you look at the mountains of New England, they tend to run in a northeast to southwest direction like this. And, it, and these are the, the geologic, what they call terrains of New England. And they run in a northeast to southwest direction because they all represent different island arcs and similar structures that were kind of plastered on to New England. The one I wanna talk about the most is this one here. You see this pink? That's Avalonia. And remains of this island arc have been found everywhere from Newfoundland to Georgia. So this was a very large island arc. And it just so happens that our little part of it is southeastern New England. Okay, so let's go on. We're gonna, now we're gonna start talking about where where our rocks came from. So the Blackstone Valley, the story of the geology of the Blackstone Valley itself starts about a billion years ago, somewhere between 750 and 1.2 billion years ago, um, with a, a formation of a group of rocks that we call quite appropriately the Blackstone Group. So our story is going to start, imagine this is off the coast of Africa. Our story doesn't start in North America, it starts in Africa. And this is a time when blue-green algae had dominated the world for two billion years, but it started to get competition that it never had before from a new kind of life. And the new kind of life we call animals, single-celled animals were just evolving. At least that's what we believe. The world also had been frozen uh, this is something that when I was in college in the 1980s, we knew nothing about. But now we're coming to realize that in this period of time, and before this period of time, there had been a time of what's called the snowball earth, where even the oceans were frozen for miles thick. And the reason it took us a long time to figure that out, because the earth was so frozen that you really didn't have any sedimentation making a rock record, because all of the water bodies were frozen and the oceans were frozen down to down to maybe a mile thick. Still some debate about whether the entire earth was frozen or maybe it was a little slushy at the equator, but much of the earth was frozen. So it had thawed 
and life was starting to really bloom again. And as I mentioned, these new things called animals were evolving. But the part that, that matters to us in the Blackstone Valley is off the coast of Africa in the ocean, you started having the rivers that run off of Africa. And at the time it was called Gondwana land because it had a few other continents with it. In Gondwana land off the coast, you had rivers that just like they do today, they were dumping mud and they were dumping sand and they were um, limestone was precipitating out as well in what was called the Iapetus Ocean. And so these sediments became buried and compacted. And when you bury, you put enough sediment on top of them, they form sedimentary rocks, which are shales, limestones, and sandstones. So these were the first rocks that we see in the Blackstone Valley. And this is an example of the Blackstone group. This is by the Kelly House on the Cumberland side. And this here on the top, let me get my pen out again. I'll get my spotlight out. Um, this here on the top, this, is, this was sandstone. So this at one time was sand. And down below, it, it was, uh, this was, I think, shale. Oop. This was shale. And uh, what it tells you, again, every rock tells a story. This, what we're seeing here is the sandstone. The sand represents more fast moving water, probably nearer to the shore. And the, the muds tend to represent uh, very quiet waters, like uh, farther away off the ocean. So why did it turn from sand to mud? Maybe the sea level rose, or from mud to sand, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe the sea level became uh, shallower, so the sea level dropped. Or maybe there was some uplift of the land. You can't really tell just based on this one outcrop, but there's a lot of information here. And I'm going to talk more about what happened because these rocks didn't get preserved in their original state. They got pretty mangled later on. I keep that in mind. The Blackstone group, it's these shales, um, or it was shales. They're now called greenstones because they got pretty abused. And we'll talk about that. The limestone got pretty abused and became marble. And the sandstone got abused and it became quartzite. So uh, this is at Lincoln Woods, and it just kind of looks blobby. I think also mixed in with these sedimentary rocks are uh, layers of basalt that volcanoes would erupt and the, the lava would, would roll out like a, like a sea. And I, it's a little hard to tell whether this was originally shale or basalt, but I think this one was basalt. This is on the northern side of Lincoln Woods. So, um, go on. This is, I keep, I keep forgetting to erase myself. I like to make all these drawings. Okay, this is uh, lime rock quarry. So this is part of the marble, the limestone. Nowadays, limestone usually comes from living creatures. They pull the calcium carbonate out of the water and they make shells, clam shells, microscopic organisms, even algae make cal calcium carbonate shells all the way up to, to much bigger animals. But in these days, this was before animals had really figured out, had evolved, animals and plants had evolved the, the uh, ability to make their own shells. So there was a lot more calcium in the water and it under certain geochemical conditions in very warm water, it would precipitate out. And that's where we believe this came from. And of course, you all know, limestone was important to the economy of this region. It's partly why we built the canal, right? Because we wanted to bring that lime. You take this marble, it's actually marble now. You take this marble, you crush it up. That gives you lime to make cement and um, that you need for all sorts of building. So, um, the Blackstone group began off the coast of Africa. And it's, it's a little bit debated as to how this happened, but part of the coast of Africa gets pushed off away from Africa. And there may have been uh, a, a divergent plate that ripped it up, but 
it, it moves off the coast of Africa and it becomes an, part of an island arc. So the Blackstone group would have been, you know, these, these uh, muds and shales and limestone that, that got deposited uh, under, under in the water off the coast. And then what happened is this became an island arc and one ocean plate started going below the other and you had volcanoes. So you have these huge molten masses that start rising up. And in this case, most of them were, were a very light material that, that makes up granite. And in this case, the light material is very, very viscous, doesn't like to move and it never made it all the way to the surface. The fact that it didn't make it all the way to the surface meant it could, over tens of thousands of years, the crystals could slowly grow and they could grow into a granite. And the thing about a granite is you can actually see the individual crystals. You know, there's pieces of feldspar and pieces of mica and pieces of quartz, um, that little crystals that you can see because it was it wasn't cooled all at once. All volcanic rocks are crystalline, but sometimes it cools all at once. You can only see the crystals under a microscope. In this case, it took a long time to cool, so it grows into crystals that you can actually see. So this is the Esmond Igneous uh, series of rocks. So they work their way up underneath, through, and around all of that Blackstone group. We have a couple questions while you were talking yes. about the limestone. It's my sure. it's pertinent to what you're on. At sure, I'll go side. back to the limestone. Yeah, um, you know, the marble outcrop is this part of the commercial lime quarry in Cumberland? This Not is right so across much. from, uh, right across from the commercial lime quarry in Lincoln, right okay. off of 146. Is marble elsewhere like this to view? Uh, there's marble in a few other locations. Um, this is the best one I know of in the area. Um, maybe uh, maybe Dave Newton will chime in and tell us about another one. There's uh, there's also uh, an outcrop of marble near the uh, near the golf course further south. But this and that um, was the, that was also a question. So this is considered an outcrop. Yes. Okay. All right. We've got our questions answered, and if anybody just. Ask in the chat and I'll ask Mark as what slide we're talking about. If that's so just to, and just to set the, the, the background for you, yeah. I included this. This is what North America looked like 600 million years ago. So this is at a time when now this island, that Avalonia, which is going to become uh, southern New England, this island's out here somewhere. We don't know exactly what it looked like. It may have been one long island, a thousand miles long or it may have been a series of small islands a thousand miles long, or it may have through different volcanoes gone through a lot of different shapes over, over the hundreds of millions of years that it existed. But the islands move in this way towards North America. This is the coast of North America. So this is about the New York border here. Um, Florida would be down here because it hadn't grown out into the ocean yet. And this is the Midwest, Kansas, um, Kansas, Texas, all of this is ocean. It's, it's from a geologic standpoint, it's continental material, but it's low and it's lower than the ocean. This is also a time when you didn't have uh, glaciers. So the, the sea level is higher. This is Greenland up here. So Greenland has always been part of North America, but New England hasn't, interestingly. So this is what North America looks like at the time mostly Canada up down to Texas, but a lot different than today's. So um, Laurentia is relative to Avalonia is moving this way to the Southeast and Avalonia is moving Northwest. Gondwana lands also moving towards North America. Okay. So we're in for some trouble. And by the way, this is at a time when five or 600 million years ago, this was a really unique, unprecedented, special time in all the world's history. 
because this is a time when over a, a short period of time, maybe 10 million years, almost every major group of life forms that exist today, including vertebrates, which is our group, evolved. It's known as the Cambrian explosion. Really special, really unique. Some of the rocks of the group probably would have had some wonderful fossils in it were it not for what happens next. So we know a lot about what happened in that period of time from fossils from other places, not here. Um, so just to orient you on a map of what kind of rocks we're talking about, um, this, these yellow rocks are rocks that are gonna be deposited later and we'll talk about those later. But see this pink here? These, these pink rock here, that's the Blackstone group. So you'll see them like near the 295 Visitors Center, the Kelly House, into Albion. You'll see them in um, Winsocket, and you'll see them farther north up in, um, up in Massachusetts as well. All this stuff here, this is igneous rock of that Esmond igneous suite. And this goes into Massachusetts and most of the Massachusetts part of the Blackstone Valley is going to be covered. Uh, most of the rock you'll see is that Esmond igneous rock. So it's that granite type of rock that, uh, that you'll see everywhere. And it was a very popular building stone. So you'll see a lot of buildings made out of it as well. It's very strong. One of the rocks that was deposited at this time that's really unique and really special and um, is the state rock of Rhode Island, where I think we're the only state that has a state rock. It's, Cumber it's called Cumberlandite. It occurs, at least in North America, it occurs only in Cumberland. If somebody calls it Cumberlandite, you know that geologist is from Rhode Island because most of them would call it a ultramafic porphyritic gabbro. But this is Cumberlandite. And this is a boulder that is at the, um, uh, is it the Friends of the Blackstone? It's Sycamore Landing, correct. The Blackstone River Watershed Council's Friends of the Blackstone, their educational center. Right, so drive by there if you want to see a piece of Cumberlandite. Cumberlandite is really unique for a few reasons. And the first is, um, what happens when you have, I talked a lot about those plumes of magma that are underneath the earth and and slowly crystallizing. Well, sometimes the process is so slow that the crystals form and they drop to the bottom. Now, magma is very viscous, so this needs a lot of time to happen. But the crystals might form and drop to the bottom. Something like if you have hot chocolate and you let it cool a little bit and all the, the sugary chocolate goes to the bottom, the milk goes to the top. Well, the the crystals that form and go to the bottom tend to be what we call mafic. They have more iron, more magnesium, they're heavy, they're black and green. The material that, that is at the top is lighter material, a lot more quartz and feldspar. If you give it enough time, this plume will actually change. You have the heavy stuff on the bottom and you'll have the lighter stuff on the top it differentiates itself. Now, this particular magma that made Cumberlandite would be from the bottom of that batholith, but it had an extraordinary, to some extraordinary degree, it differentiated itself in the heaviest of the heavy minerals. It just looks so, like a rock. <laughs> This isn't just like a regular basalt. Yeah, it looks like just a regular rock, but it's not, it's really special. And this is, now we call that, when it has a lot of the iron and magnesium, we call it mafic. This is ultra mafic. This is the mafix mafic rock. Um, and if you look at it carefully, um, something else you'll notice about it too. And I said, it's ultra mafic. By the way, it is so mafic that if you put a compass to it, it will move the needle on your compass because it is a magnetic rock. And that's pretty unusual. Magnetic minerals exist in almost all rocks, but to have so much of it that it moves your compass is really unusual. Uh, but if, if you look carefully at this rock, you see these crystals, these lighter crystals, 
lighter colored crystals. That, remember I said, if you give it enough time, that, that uh, crystals can grow big enough that you can see them. But then you have a matrix where you can't see these crystals. These are microscopic. So this is like what would happen if it, if it erupted or came near the, the, uh, the lava came near the surface of the earth and it cooled really suddenly. This is like what happens when it cools really slowly. It's a porphyry because it did both. It cooled really slowly and then for some reason it left where it was and it went up and it went up fairly rapidly and then the rest of it crystallized. So it's a porphyry. Um, that is, and this rock is so unusual and so rare that you only find it in, you only find an outcrop of it in Cumberland. That's it. If you find it anywhere else, it came from Cumberland and it got there. Um, and I'm going to talk about that later too, so keep that in mind. But there's the one rock and it only comes from one little place in Northern Cumberland, maybe, I don't know, an acre or two. It, 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 it's a small outcrop uh, north of Diamond Hill. Okay, so there's your Cumberlandite. Mark, um, I have a question. Yes. Um, can fossils uh, be found near the Blackstone River? I keep that thought. Okay. Right Is now, question, right? Go ahead. Right now, you're not going to find a lot of fossils in any rocks that I've talked about for two reasons. One is the volcanic rocks just destroy all the fossils. It it would melt them. Um, so the volcanic rocks don't have fossils. The Blackstone group doesn't have fossils for two reasons. And one is the most important is the multicellular, large multicellular organisms with hard body parts hadn't evolved yet. So there's no fossils. Even if it was really well preserved, there probably wouldn't be much of anything except some really vague looking fossils because most organisms hadn't evolved yet that make fossils. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what happens is you had, so you have this, this rock and it, it, um, the Blackstone Valley, as it forms an island arc and it's going into North America and it's, it's, uh, it's colliding with the North American continent. So while this all was going on, you had the Avalonia, this big series of islands does collide into the continent and it, it builds, it builds mountains. It also, um, take some of that sediment that was on the bottom of the ocean, sedimentary rocks, and it pushes them up and it slaps them on the coast of North America. And so we know that it didn't start out in North America because there are parts outside of the Blackstone Valley. There are some relatively old fossils of, of Avalonia that are maybe 600, 500, 450 million years ago that look a lot more like African species than they look like North American species because it started off the coast of Africa and um, it has more in common with the African. So this guy here, this fossil I showed you in the beginning has more in common with the kind of trilobites you'd find in, in New England, Eastern New England, than the trilobites you would find elsewhere in the United States. So, um, a Avalonia collides with North America and, um, but at some point it starts pulling apart. And in the Blackstone Valley, uh, we're part of that area that starts getting ripped apart. And when it gets ripped apart, it's a divergent plate boundary. It's where the two part of the continent starts ripping apart and magma starts boiling up Remember I showed you that of a continent being torn apart and a sea developing? Well, the magma that came up is, is gonna be another uh, group of, and we call them intrusions, another group of, of uh, 
rocks from the magma that comes up when the rifting starts and it makes what's called the situate batholith. So the situate batholith is much younger than the others and that's a rock you'll see in western Rhode Island and it also around the area of Cumberland it produces a, a granite intrusion and it's just the opposite of Cumberlandite even though it's not that far away. It's very light has a lot of quartz and feldspar, and it's it's so light. Well, I'll talk about that in a minute. The other thing is a large fault forms, um, and it drops down. It creates a valley, what's called a graben, throughout most of eastern Rhode Island, which is the Blackstone Valley, and into Massachusetts, all the way to like Plymouth. Other depressions form as well because these fractures. Uh, so you have oh, an area, another area in Woonsocket called the Woonsocket Basin. And when you form these low areas that are probably underwater and lower than everything else, it starts getting filled up. Okay. The, I mentioned about the, uh, the, the granitic intrusion. And of course, you all know Diamond Hill. Diamond Hill had this very light quartz material that had a long, incredibly long time to, to crystallize. So long that when you go to Diamond Hill, and I hope all of you have, you go to Diamond Hill, you can pick up and you can see these fractures have formed these beautiful geodes where the just the quartz that it had, either it cooled slowly enough or perhaps more likely it cooled and then partially melted and just the quartz melted. But the quartz was able to fill all these fractures and be under just perfect conditions that it makes the most beautiful crystals. Thus it got the name Diamond Hill. You know, fool's gold, this is kind of fool's diamond. I took this picture last week when it was incredibly cold. Okay, so we have these basins. And if you think about it, and um, sorry, I didn't include a graphic of this. Uh, if you think about it, so you have you have an area that that it's it's one consistent um, surface, and then you have a fault form here, and you have a fault form here because you're stretching something apart, and it moves down. So what you get is this, and we call this a graben or a basin, and because it's lower than everything else all the sh sand and shale and rocks are gonna fall into that. So it's gonna have sedimentary deposits. The biggest one of this being the Narragansett Basin, but also the Woonsocket Basin. Let me erase my doodles there. Okay. So these are the kind of rocks that are forming when this fissure is taking place about between 300, 390 million years ago. It was a really special time. It was the time I specialized in graduate school on. This is a Carboniferous period. It's where almost all the coal in the world comes from the Carboniferous period. It was a time when amphibians were the dominant animal because recently the fish had learned, had evolved the ability to breathe air and walk on land. And that long process I could go on all night about. Uh, and you started having the first reptiles. But most importantly, you had the first trees and that is really huge. And I don't mean that just literally, uh, that up until then plants hadn't evolved cellulose. So the plants that were around were really just uh, either algae or vines or they, were, they didn't have the ability to be tall. They did, but when plants evolved the ability to make cellulose, it was a game changer because I could be above all the other plants and I could hog all the sunlight. So an arms race started as to who could, who could, which plant could grow faster and stronger and higher. And you had these enormous forests all over the world and the animals hadn't caught up. So all these, trees, and they're not like today's trees, they're more like ginkgos, but these trees formed and they died by the billions and the billions. And the animals and the fungus hadn't caught up 
that it hadn't developed the ability to degrade cellulose. You didn't have termites, you didn't have the, and termites, their, their digestive system is so complex. It took a hundred million years to evolve that. So in the meantime, you had all these trees growing and dying. And when the trees died, they didn't break down. So you had all over the world, you had this tremendous growth of trees that the, the cellulose of those trees was not being broken down. And this actually changed the atmosphere of the earth that it pulled so much carbon dioxide because that's what plants make trees out of, carbon dioxide, pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, combines it with water and then makes cellulose. And it kept doing that and because the, the trees were getting buried, they would just get carried down by rivers and broken apart and buried under, under uh, sediment. It actually changed the chemistry of the world that it lowered the carbon dioxide level, increased the oxygen level to a super oxygenated environment. And that had a couple of, of, of um, effects. The most obvious of which, it's the exact opposite of what's happening today. Um, global cooling, because it cooled the world by sequestering all that carbon and forming coal. Uh, today, we're kind of reversing the process by digging up the coal, burning it, and putting carbon back. But it caused global cooling, but it also caused super oxygenated environment, which meant that insects could breathe much easier. So you had millipedes that were three or four feet long. You had dragonflies the size of bigger than eagles that because the earth was so super oxygenated, it wasn't hard for insects to grow to huge heights. Well, it's really, it really was a special time. And we have a record of that in the valley. Um, this is a fossil, I actually have it here in my living room. This is uh, one of the plant fossils. Probably the only kind of fossil you're gonna find in the Blackstone Valley is plant fossils. They're plant, they're, they're, it's from some of the shales that if there's enough plant, it ends up being coal. And if there are plants mixed with mud, it ends up being a shale. But you can see the stem of the plant. Um, let me see. I've got to, got to draw here. Okay, so you can see the stem right there. There's a stem here, there's a stem here. You can see all these stems preserved in the rock. You can also find leaves. Uh, this was a time again, which was the plants were going through unprecedented growth. Also, as I, I mentioned a lot about um, coal and we did, we were one of the coal producing regions, probably before uh, Pennsylvania. This, this belt that you find, and by the way, the name of this, the rocks in this basin that I described, that's the Narragansett Formation. And this is the Narragansett Basin right here. This is the, uh, I believe this here is the Winsocket Basin. And I forgot the name of this one, one that goes into Massachusetts. But these little basins, the fractures form and they fill up with sedimentary rocks and they fill up with sedimentary rocks of the Carboniferous period. So, um, I will talk a little bit. Remember what I said about the all the plants and all of the coal being buried and all? Remember that because I'm going to come back to it. So this process of rifting apart reverses because Gondwana land, which includes Africa, is moving towards the United States or to, towards North America. And um, 300 million years ago, the the deposition in these basins stops because Africa slams into North America. And it's gonna be very much like what happened when India slammed into Europe, uh, slammed into Asia. So this is, this is Gondwana land, this is Africa going this way. This is North America and they hit in Southern New, in, in New England, but they hit everywhere from Newfoundland. Eventually the collision will move its way all the way down to Oklahoma you'll form Himalayan-sized mountains. 
got 20, 30,000 foot mountains by this enormous collision. This, there's no more deposition because everything that was on the surface is getting pushed way, way up. Um, but it's also getting twisted around, which is why we have record of many different ages because it gets folded and bent and thrust so there are there are earthquakes there are there are volcanoes there's all kinds of things going on and the two continents start looking like this this is north america and africa together the all the continents of the world are colliding and will soon make pangaea one giant continent connecting all which is composed of all the continents and then one giant ocean around them so these mountains will have an impact on the rest of North America because the mountains of the East Coast, the Appalachian Mountains, when they first formed in this Allegheny orogeny that happened between 300 million and 245 million years ago, these mountains are going to erode all the way from then they're still eroding. So they've been eroding for 200 million years, 250 million years. They will provide the sediment that builds up thousands of rocks that are thousands of feet thick all through the Midwestern United States, because there'll be rivers that go as, as big as the Mississippi, um, just like the Ganges or any that, that drain these tremendously high mountain ranges. Um, but that's what it does on a national level. But what it does here is it creates regional metamorphism, that you have rocks that are so high and you've got so much pressure on them and heat on them that you change the character of the rocks. You actually distort the minerals within them. Sometimes you even partially melt the minerals. So these huge changes are gonna change everything that was formed, everything I talked about, granite, shale, limestone, all, it all gets what's called metamorphosed and it becomes something else. The granites, which have this sort of random crystallized structure they're gonna become granite gneisses. And the thing about granite gneisses is they have this um, foliated, what we call foliated structure. The more pressure you put them under, the more foliated they are. And as you get closer to Worcester, things become more foliated, more metamorphosed, higher pressure. But you're, you're putting miles and miles and miles and miles of rock on top of them. You're changing the granites to granite gneisses. But that's not all you're doing. You're changing the coal. So the coal starts out as peat. And then you put it, you bury it and you take out, it takes out some of the water when you bury it and it reduces the pore space and it becomes lignite, just like a low grade coal. And then it becomes bituminous coal and we call this soft coal. The further you go in this direction, it gets less, the moisture gets decreased, the color changes to black. Um, the carbon content increases and the caloric value increases. So if you press it enough, you'll get anthracite. And that's what you find in the Blackstone Valley is anthracite because you put enough pressure on it. Now, those of you that know anthracite, it's shiny, it's black and it's shiny. This stuff will burn really easily. You could light it with a match. Anthracite, you need to really get it going before it's going to ignite. And Rhode Island coal is a particularly high grade of anthracite. So one of the statements that was made about anthracite is that, uh, about Rhode Island coal, because Rhode Island had a coal industry and we had coal mines, including um, a famous one in Cumberland near uh, Town Hall where the, does anybody know the Lusitania Club, the Portuguese club? 1981, there was a collapse right at the edge of the Portuguese club where the coal mine that everybody forgot about collapsed in um, because it had been 150, I don't know, 150 years since somebody had mined coal. But the Rhode Island coal was such a high grade of coal that a statement was once made that when the fires of hell consume the earth, the last thing that burns is Rhode Island's coal. Uh, I'm sure that was from somebody who was really frustrated trying to get it to burn. Okay, I know, I know I'm, getting, uh, I'm getting low on time. The other thing about metamorphism is it makes great building stones because those things like the shales, 
they get um, they get squished into phyllites and greenstones and they get more foliation and it's really easy to build buildings with them because they tend to be flat and square. Um, so this is this, um, the one next to Slater Mill. Is it Wilkinson? My wife tells me it's Wilkinson Mill. She was a guide, so she knows. Even the granites, the granites turn to granite nieces and they get to be, that's what makes them such a nice building stone. This is the lock in Millville, isn't it? I think, Suzanne? Yes, think that, is a, this picture. that is the That's, Millville lock. You can access that right off the bikeway. So again, it makes it, it makes nicer building stones because it's, uh, the minerals are all squished. And it takes a lot of those shales and basalts and it makes what's called greenstone. And I think this is from, this is from the bike path and up in the Albion area. And what it does, you had shales or basalts, they're actually made of similar minerals. You put so much pressure in it that you take the water and you force it into the structure of the crystal and it makes this greenish color. You see these little green veins all through it. Um, those greenish veins are, are where the water percolated through and then the water actually got forced into the matrix of the rock. So they call it greenstone. It's kind of a blackish green, a greenish black, I guess. Now, Eventually rifting happens and of course Europe and Africa pull away uh, and that keeps going on for 250 million years. But the oldest rocks are those Carboniferous rocks that I mentioned 300, 390 million years ago. That's the oldest rocks you're going to find in the valley because after that you built these huge mountain ranges and mountain ranges don't tend to deposit new sedimentary rock that's formed out in the ocean. It doesn't tend to get formed in high mountains so there's been erosion ever since but the thing about a mountain it's like an iceberg and you erode the top off and it pops up a little more because mountains have like a root where they float in the mantle so it's been 250 million years 300 million years of erosion and yet some of the mountains are still there uh, the most resistant are like the granites and the gneisses. That's why the western part of our state is so hilly. The, the, the Narragansett Formation, those rocks tend to be a little softer. And that's why areas like Pawtucket tend to be flatter. So, oop, let me, uh, uh, I went too fast. Okay. Um, the other thing is you have a lot of fractures because you put these rocks under so much pressure, you made faults and thrust faults. And um, when, they're, when they're really hot, they bend, but when they're near the surface, they tend to crack. Um, this was a picture that I think Bonnie sent me just yesterday. And I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure this is a fault. Um, that the, the lines are so smooth that I'm pretty sure this here is a fault that went through and the fault breaks up the rock and it makes it it makes it less strong so over time it erodes away if you uh, have a chance to go to um, a purgatory chasm purgatory chasm is believed to be a fault that maybe eroded faster when the glaciers came through and I'll talk a little bit about that next so you don't have much much evidence left of everything from like 300 million years to 20,000 years ago, but then you had the glaciers come. And of course, our whole region got uh, mowed over by glaciers a mile, two miles thick that covered all of North America down to Long Island and Block Island. Um, remember I talked about Cumberlandite? The only place you can find Cumberlandite is that one little outcrop in Northern Cumberland. Well, that turned out to be really useful because how exactly did the glacier travel? We know exactly how the glacier traveled because we find little pieces of Cumberlandite and you can't miss it. It's a rock that it's magnetic, it's heavy, and it has big um, greenish crystals in it in a black matrix. You can't miss it. So it all came from here. So when you find a piece of Cumberlandite here or here or here or here, or even on Block Island, which we found Cumberlandite on, it's because a glacier carried it. So you don't find here and here because the glacier that went through Cumberland didn't go there. The glacier went here. And we know the direction that the glaciers moved in because we know where the Cumberlandite is. So it turned out 
having this one really easy recognizable rock that only occurred in one place was a really valuable thing for helping us track where the glaciers came. And of course, you know, the glacier stopped right here, which is why Long Island and Block Island and Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket are the edge of where that glacier came. The sea level was so low that this was all dry land. So it bulldozed the sediment, which is why we don't have a hundred feet of nice arable soil, right? You dig down 20 or 30, 10 or 20 feet in Rhode Island, you generally hit um, bedrock because the glacier is like a bulldozer and it took away all of our nice soil. And it took thousands of years to get any soil back at all. What it leaves us as the glacier retreats, it left. Now, this is a moraine, this is a moraine like the one I showed you, Long Island, Block Island. And this is a second moraine because it retreated and then it advanced again, but it didn't go quite as far. And this was the place it left, which is the southern coast of Rhode Island and Cape Cod. It's that second terminal moraine. But then as the glacier retreats, it doesn't retreat evenly. Sometimes it stays in one place for a while and some places, sometimes it goes a little faster. Sometimes it partially melts and it makes big ice dams. Sometimes it makes big lakes in, in front of the glacier. Now, normally what happens is glaciers are dirty. And uh, I mentioned, uh, when you look at here, there's a lot of sediment in those glaciers. And so um, it leaves all the rock and clay and it's, it's, it doesn't sort anything. It just kind of carries it all on top. And it leaves all that unsorted clay and boulders and everything. We call it glacial till. And it's what makes up most of the, the sediment that's on top of our bedrock. And those of you that know, it's not that deep and it's really hard to dig in because you keep hitting boulders and cobbles and whatnot. That's the glacial till. But every now and then you have a lake and all the sediment filled water that comes out of the glacier dumps the sediment into the lake and you get a really thick sediment. And those thick sediments, we, we call that glacial outwash when you have a chance for it to sort. So instead of having cobbles mixed with clay and sand and everything else, you have some large beds that are all muddy or all sandy and you have soils that you can dig into. And if you look at where the graveyards are in Rhode Island, these kind of areas tend to be where people get graveyards because it's really hard to dig and till and you don't have to dig very far before you hit bedrock. So let's see. Okay. And you also have, and we started talking about this guy in the beginning, right? glacial erratics, that you have some of these huge boulders that the glacier carries and then the glacier melts where it melts and it dropped the boulder on top that was on top of it. Eventually the boulder fell down. This boulder doesn't come from the Blackstone Valley. It came from farther north. It's from a different rock formation and it got dropped there. Sometimes these can, glaciers can carry rocks hundreds of miles or even thousands of miles. So they call these glacial erratics. It's erratic because it doesn't really belong there. It doesn't really fit the geology. So you get these kind of exotic rocks. And uh, this is just another uh, map showing where the, the moraines were. But what I wanted to point out with the Blackstone Valley down in Providence and Pawtucket, the east side like Swan Point, that's where you get that the thick deposit of sediment. And most of the rest of the area that we live in is till, okay? It's that stuff that's not fun to dig in. Anybody that's dug in till can tell you. I know I'm getting, I'm you know we're running short on time here. Um, and ice dams are another way that you sometimes have ice within the glacier or ice with, with um, or bodies of water with glacier down, glacial um, ice downstream of it. And the ice dams will form dams uh, that, that uh, keep the water in a place for a period of time. Then the ice dam will melt and the water will suddenly rush out. Some people that think that's what happened with Purgatory Chasm, that you had this massive uh, glacial 
dam that let go and it caused, it made the erosion much worse, which is why you have this huge chasm there. We don't know for sure. But the, the one thing that it does do, and this is purgatory chasm as well, um, this is not the normal way that rocks weather. The rock is this smooth because the glacier came through and polished it. And glaciers, they're dirty, so it's ice with pieces of rock in it. And it's just putting it in a rock polisher over and over again. And if you look carefully on this rock, you will see striations, that you'll see scratches in the rock and they show you which way the glacier moved over that rock. Um, so this is another one Bonnie sent me. What's the story about this rock? I don't know. But that's, that's part of the fun is maybe when I go there, I'll find out what the story is. So this is what I wanna leave you with. Um, every rock has a story and maybe, and I again encourage everybody, if you, um, you know, if you have a chance, you have some time, the roadside geology rocks are, re, uh, roadside geology books, they have one of these for almost every state and they're all great. And you can go on these drives and it'll say, oh, now you stop over here and look to the right and you'll see this happen. And it's really, so I hope that when you guys are out walking, biking, canoeing, just, you know, maybe, maybe take a moment and say, what is that? And where was that from? And, and think about, wow, that was off the coast of Africa a billion years ago. So thank you everyone for your attention. Um, how many people do we still have? Still um, have 89 people. We didn't lose too yeah, many. Yeah, you do. Really good. Thank you, Mark.